This week's episode is brought to you in part by KiwiCo. KiwiCo creates super cool hands-on projects for kids of all ages that make learning about science, technology, engineering, art, and math fun. Inspire creative confidence this year with KiwiCo. KiwiCo is offering Science Magazine podcast listeners the chance to try them for free. To redeem this offer and learn more, visit kiwico.com slash magazine. That's K-I-W-I-C-O dot com slash magazine. This week's episode is also brought to you by the Pew Charitable Trust podcast, After the Fact. It's been more than 30 years since a new type of antibiotic has made it to market. Now, I bet you're wondering why. A stat is only the beginning of the story. To understand the numbers shaping society's biggest challenges, listen to After the Fact, a podcast from the Pew Charitable Trust, available on Stitcher and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Visit pewtrusts.org slash science mag to learn more. Welcome to the Science Podcast for January 18th, 2018. I'm Sarah Crespi. In this week's show, I talk with staff writer Paul Vusen about comparing the insides of the two biggest planets in the solar system. This is based on data from Cassini at Saturn and Juno at Jupiter. And Megan Cantwell talks with science writer Laura Spinney about fighting an Ebola epidemic in the face of conspiracy theories and fake news in the Democratic Republic of Congo. First up, we have staff writer Paul Vusen. He's going to talk about dueling spacecraft, Juno at Jupiter and Cassini at Saturn, and what they can tell us about the interiors of these gas giants. Hi, Paul. Hello. So the first time I brought this Cassini paper up to you, uh, you said you've been waiting for a year <laughs> to write about this. What what was the holdup or, or how come you timed it that way? So the Cassini mission ended year and a half ago, I believe mm-hmm. it was, September, where it burned up in the atmosphere of Saturn. And it had always been promised that these gravity results would be one of the hallmarks of this final campaign. And part of my job is to chase down these types of results at you know meetings and things like that before they actually reach the pages of a place like science. They were very canny and not presenting it. So I've been <laughs> hunting for this and waiting. I knew the Jupiter results came out but I wanted to compare and contrast with Saturn. So that's why I waited till now. Okay, so these are gravity results. What exactly were they measuring about Saturn's gravity? When the spacecraft is, it's orbiting the planet and as it comes really close to the atmosphere, tiny variations in the gravity inside the planet can actually cause it to speed up and slow down. Hmm. And that results in a small shift, a Doppler shift in the radio signal that it sends back to Earth. Oh, so the craft itself is speeding up and slowing down just a tiny bit in response to the gravity. And then we can read that in what radio waves are being back to Earth. Yes, it's actually we send the radio waves to it. They're reflected back. OK, and we measure the Doppler shift in that. Very cool. So what do these tiny shifts indicate in the gravity of Saturn? One big question was the winds on Saturn. It's also on Jupiter. But scientists have always wondered how deep they reach. Are they shallow like the Earth or do they reach all the way deep down into the planet? Those are the two camps. So when you say shallow, you mean that they're they're taking up a big percentage of the atmosphere? Like Yeah, essentially they're just like the wind on Earth. So, you know, this is maybe a one percent of the atmosphere. Okay. okay. Or there's something much deeper. Which is definitely possible because these are giant planets and they're very gassy, mm-hmm. very far down, right? Yes. So what what did the gravity measurements um, from the, the Cassini mission say about the winds on Saturn? So they actually found that the winds went down about 9,000 kilometers, maybe 10,000, which is in between these two ideas of what they would be. And that actually was corroborating findings also on Jupiter. So the the two have kind of matched up to form this new theory for why winds stretch this certain amount of depth and then the planet locks up and rotates like a solid. The winds are going to a medium depth in both of these gas giants. Mm -hmm. What do you mean locked up like a solid <laughs> in the center of the planet. As you get to a certain depth, the pressure is just crazy down there. And you get to about 100,000 times the pressure on Earth. And, and, and at the pressure and heat, the uh, hydrogen kind of partially ionizes. So it becomes like a semiconductor. Okay. You go to much deeper and it becomes metallic. But this is not that region. Okay. So the semiconductor hydrogen can be influenced by the magnetic field of the planet which then arrests the impulses of the wind from higher up reaching down. 
as the magnetic field does not like to get crossed up. Further down, further down, there is probably a solid core. Is that supported by Saturn's Cassini readings and Jupiter's Juno readings? So the cores are really a, a, still a big mystery. So on Saturn especially, they're really just trying to still puzzle out what they know about the core. So there are some suggestions, but you have to use these models to kind of interpret the planet. So everything is kind of contingent mm -hmm. on this model. But there are some suggestions that perhaps the core is more starkly defined on Saturn than on Jupiter, where it seems to be an indication that on Jupiter, it's kind of this very diffuse thing. We don't know on either if they're solid oh, or wow. liquid or whatever. I mean, really, we don't know if they exist, you know, to a certain <laughs> extent or how you define a core. Right. But, so if there's no borders and it's not a solid, is it just the center part of the planet? <laughs> it's, a, it's like a heavier concentration of what they call heavy elements, yeah. which is essentially everything that's not hydrogen and helium. Right. Can you describe some of the kind of the extreme features that make it so difficult to study the interiors of these planets? These conditions, these would not be habitable conditions on Saturn. The, the winds there especially go, I think, about 1,800 kilometers per hour at the surface near the equator. The... The planet spins incredibly quickly. You know, its full rotation is about 10 and a half hours, though. That's uncertain by about 15 minutes or so. And Still not resolved. so big. It's not <laughs> yeah. like the Earth's like a 10-hour day. It's like something how many times bigger than the Earth spinning that fast? Yeah. It's amazing. A lot times. <laughs> <laughs> These fuzzy borders on Jupiter's core, it, it kind of makes us question how these planets were formed. If they don't have a rocky core, did they ever, how did they start if that wasn't the way it began? Right. So there used to be this kind of classical theory about how the giant planets formed, gas giants formed, that you would have this core and then it would suck up all the gas from the protoplanetary disk. But this could be an indication that perhaps as Jupiter was forming, the rock or ice was vaporized at these high pressures and the gas was being entrained at the same time. So it was all this kind of melange from the start rather than, you know, this kind of stately progression. Hmm. Let's go to some specifically Saturn things. And mm -hmm. that means Saturn's rings, but also something you call the dark side of Saturn's gravity. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know what that is. Can you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a coining of Luciano, who's the lead author on the paper. And essentially they're able to explain you know, certain parts of the gravity signal they got at Cassini. But then there's also this pole that did not match up with the wind, something from the deep interior of Saturn they just couldn't explain. And they know the signal is not present on Jupiter because we have the parallel mm -hmm. Juno results. And really, no one knows what it means. It could be something manifesting from the wind that they don't understand, perhaps, but it could also be something about the interior that they just a lumpy don't get. part. <laughs> a what? A lumpy part that has. Yeah. <laughs> it could be, you know, a lack of convection yeah. or, you know, really just no one knows. So there's right a now. very strange gravitational signal in there somewhere. But yeah. This... There's not a model for it yet. No. Okay. Very cool. That is the dark side of Saturn's gravity. So one other thing I learned from this from this story is that Saturn vibrates in a way that affects its rings. Can you talk about how that relationship works and what that means the rings can tell us about the interior of Saturn? Yeah. So for some reason, we don't know Saturn vibrates. It could be something about these you know, winds distorting it, or it could be all its tiny moons pulling on it. But these oscillations manifest themselves in the rings and these little patterns inside the rings that scientists have known about since the 90s that form kind of from the broad scale, the spiral arm, kind of like a galaxy spiral arm. From these, you can actually conduct what they call ring seismology and mm -hmm. infer things about the interior of the planet. So you can look at that pattern in the rings and know something about the gravity and the shape of what's going on inside of Saturn. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a tricky field. It's really only, it's barely been pursued. A few really pioneering researchers have pushed it through. Yeah. People have been painstakingly looking at the rings over the Cassini mission to, you know, find all of these features. This is, you know, a couple dozen features people have found. So mm -hmm. it's not a ton. And they're st still starting to piece together what's happening there. Very cool. So, you know, there's a real potential there that you might be able to tease something out about the deep interior of the planet that you couldn't get with the other Cassini data. One other thing that we wanted to get to from the Cassini data is the age of the rings. How is that determined and, and how, how old are they? 
This has been a big question. This was yeah. one of the primary things they hope to figure out with Cassini, especially in the grand finale. So there had been long view that the rings were kind of massive and old, you know, maybe as old as Saturn or close to as old as Saturn. And what the, they've done with this, the grand finale, is since they went between the rings and Saturn, they were able to measure the mass of the rings. The mass of the rings was much lower than some scientists had thought. And a low mass means a young age. Based on this understanding of the mass of the rings, what, how old do the researchers think they are? So they actually think they're between 10 and 100 million years old. They could be younger than the dinosaurs, the extinction oh, of the dinosaurs. Really? So if they had been looking out at Saturn, they would not have seen rings. If probably. there were dinosaur astronomers. Yes, dinosaurs are very good. Okay, Paul, so what's next for looking at the interior of these giants? You know, there's going to be a lot of data to still plumb. Juno's only halfway through its mission, so they'll have a ton more data there. There is no mission plan to Saturn in the future right now. People have been calling for, you know, a dedicated orbiter, but that, you know, there's a lot of planetary <laughs> science to happen, and Cassini was a big mission. So this might be the best data we have, and that might be a call for more of this ring seismology to get out what's going on. And Cassini data will be keeping people busy on its own for decades. Right. Thanks a lot, Paul. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Paul Vusin is a staff writer of science. You can find links to the research and his new story at sciencemag.org slash podcast. Stay tuned for Megan Cantwell's interview with Laura Spinney on countering conspiracy theories about Ebola in the DRC. This week's episode is brought to you in part by KiwiCo. KiwiCo creates super cool, hands-on projects for kids that make learning about STEAM fun. With a KiwiCo subscription, each month, the kid in your life, be it your own child, your niece, your nephew, your neighbor, will receive a fun, engaging new project, which will help develop their creativity and confidence. Imagine getting an all-in-one project. You open it on a Saturday morning. You don't have to go to the store and buy felt or seeds or soil, or anything. It's all in there. And there's also easy to follow instructions and an educational magazine to learn more about the crate's theme. Everything is created by KiwiCo's team of in-house product designers and rigorously tested by kits, which I think means that it's not very breakable. KiwiCo actually has seven different types of crates to choose from. So anything from the tadpole crate for infants, the koala crate for preschoolers, I have one of those, all the way up to the Eureka crate for anyone over 14. I guess that means adults too. KiwiCo's mission is to empower kids, not just to make a project, but to make a difference. KiwiCo is offering Science Magazine podcast listeners the chance to try this for free. To redeem the offer and learn more, visit kiwico.com slash magazine. There's an Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo, with 609 confirmed cases and 340 deaths reported. But public health officials are faced with problems beyond just treating individuals who have contracted the disease. I'm Megan Cantwell, and I'm here with Laura Spinney to talk about how the effectiveness of the response to Ebola in the DRC has depended on combating misinformation surrounding the disease. Hey, Laura. Hi. Is it likely that Ebola will spread to other regions in the Democratic Republic of Congo? They basically seem to be able to contain it in one place and then it pops up in another and then they contain it again there. So it's not spreading very fast, but they haven't quite contained it yet. North Kivu, which is where the epidemic is, is on the border with Uganda. So it, there is a possibility that it could spread across borders. If the WHO declares an international emergency, that tends to trigger countries, neighboring countries, to close their borders. And there's fairly good research that that actually doesn't necessarily help in containing an epidemic. That's interesting. Why is it that closing the border wouldn't necessarily help? Because essentially you push the problem underground. One of the most important things in controlling Ebola is about tracing contacts, so tracing people who have been exposed to patients. And if you close borders, stop people going about their normal economic activity, for example, then you reduce the likelihood that they're going to be visible to people who track those contacts. They're not just fighting Ebola in the DRC, they're also fighting misinformation, which you talk about in your piece. And one of the most striking quotes that I found was from someone from UNICEF, Carlos Navarro Colorado, who said that he usually tells his team that they're fighting two outbreaks, 
Ebola and fear. Could you explain what he means by this? It's a very frightening disease and fear is a problem wherever it crops up. It was certainly a problem in West Africa um, in 2014-2015 in, in the much bigger epidemic they had there. DRC has an extra set of problems in that, especially North Kivu, the region we're talking about, there's a lot of fighting still. It, there's basically smoldering conflict there. There's a lot of political uncertainty. You may have been following the stories over the presidential legislative elections in DRC. There's been outbreaks of fighting, uh, which have periodically shut down the the whole response mechanism to the epidemic. You tend to see a little spike in cases after that happens each time. But basically, the whole atmosphere is ripe for um, mistrust, misinformation, and fake news of all kinds, which doesn't help in fighting a, a, a dangerous disease. People are, are afraid to come forward, even if they have uh, other diseases, for example, malaria. And so people are dying of treatable diseases as well. That's why uh, Carlos Navarro Colorado talked about uh, two epidemics, one of Ebola and fear, which is that the fear keeps people away from clinics altogether. What are some of the misinformation campaigns being spread about Ebola? It's important to say, I think, that North Kivu is, a, is an opposition stronghold. It's very much opposed to um, Joseph Kabila, who is the outgoing president. So uh, a lot of the rumors had to do with Ebola being a creation made, made in government labs, government creation in order to wipe out opposition voters and voices. For example, one of, a, of an opposition um, politician who actually said that on, on the radio, on a local radio station, and there are all kinds of rumors also connected to the um, experimental vaccine, the Merck vaccine. One of the rumors about the vaccine, for example, is that it renders its recipients sterile. Absolutely no evidence of that. There's another problem, which is that because uh, supplies are relatively short, they've been putting in place a ring vaccination system where they uh, don't vaccinate everybody, but they, they vaccinate around the population affected in order to try and limit the spread. That has been in itself the source of some suspicion because the people of uh, DRC are used to mass vaccination campaigns where everybody gets the vaccine. But if only certain members of the population get it, they start to wonder, why is there a reason that person's getting it and not me? So there are all sorts of rumors flying around and the campaign is working very hard to suppress them and to, and to get accurate information out there. So what kind of strategies has the public health response been to fight this misinformation? So they have a lot of social scientists and what they call community engagement workers out there. And those people are constantly out in the communities, gathering information about how people are perceiving the epidemic, how people are perceiving the response. And they are feeding that information back into various kinds of online dashboards that have been set up by the aid agencies involved. To give you an example, one of the most contentious issues has been about the so-called safe and dignified burials, which is the protocol for disposing of the bodies of Ebola victims in a safe way so that nobody is contaminated. There was a rumor that the bodies were going into opaque body bags, but in fact they weren't. They were being stolen and their organs harvested for sale. I think that this was related to the fact that people were not able to perform their traditional burials as they were used to being able to do. And so there were all sorts of suspicions and resentment around that. There were sort of two prongs to the to the way the responders dealt with that. One was informational. They put out accurate information about why the burials had to be done this way, explaining in, in educational videos, for example. And the other was on the sort of more procurement side. This epidemic is the first time they got hold of transparent body bags so that family members could actually see their deceased relatives going into those body bags and then into the coffin, which would then be buried. And therefore, they were, you know, to kill the rumors, in fact, that that they were not being buried. These initiatives have been pretty successful then? You know, they have the impression that they are winning the information war. There are various signs of that. To give you one example, just after Christmas on the 26th of December, the National Electoral Commission announced that Beni and Butembo, which are two cities which have been foci of the outbreak, would not be allowed to take part in the elections because of the epidemic. That triggered two days of protests because their opposition areas, and they felt they were being silenced by not being able to vote. And during those protests, an Ebola evaluation center was attacked. But what was interesting was that after that happened, a lot of the opposition organizations in the area put out messages saying that they condemned the decision of the Electoral Commission, but they wanted the Ebola response to be protected. 
So you could see that they were making this separation now between the politics right. and the Ebola response. And the responders, the national and international agencies trying to contain this epidemic, considered that a small but highly significant victory. Had they seen more people come forward who suspect that they might have Ebola or displaying symptoms? Yeah, so one of the really interesting indicators is that at the beginning, people who suspected they had symptoms were basically going anywhere but the official Ebola treatment centers for a medical opinion. It was taking them a lot of stops, if you like, along the way uh, by various different kinds of traditional healers and, and local clinics before they would turn up at a treatment center. Now, basically, that chain is much shorter. People are much more likely to accept a referral to the Ebola treatment center, which suggests that, you know, the kind of fear and opacity around those treatment centers has basically been reduced by the information campaign. And a lot of things have contributed to that. One is organized visits to the treatment centers uh, by people in the community, starting with the leaders. One is the support of religious leaders in the area. The Catholic Church is very strong there. And a lot of religious leaders have been supporting the campaign by, for example, putting out information about the disease and how it's treated from the pulpit on Sunday morning. Some of the feedback from the community suggested that mothers were very worried if they were sick about what would happen to their kids when they were in the treatment center. So the responders set up creche nearby those centers to look after their children. All of these things have helped. One of the messages that came back from the West African epidemic was that people found the sirens on the ambulances that took people to the treatment centers stigmatizing. So now the ambulances that come to pick up people to take them to those treatment centers are silent. They have no sirens. So all of these are examples of how the responses used the feedback from the communities and fed it back into their response to make it more tailored to the local community and to their worries and to their perceptions and to gain their trust and cooperation. Yeah, it's amazing how coordinated an effort this is between so many different groups. Do you think that this model can be used to inform future public health efforts? Absolutely. And I think you know, there are two elements to it. So the first of all is the gathering of the information and the turning around of it very fast, feeding it back into the response. That's one thing. The other novelty about this outbreak with respect to West Africa, for example, is that in the past, all the aid agencies who have contributed to the response have been coordinated, highly coordinated, but they've essentially done their own thing and they've brought their own expertise to the problem. Now, there's a very much more integrated structure. It's essentially one response team, which is headed by the Congolese Ministry of Health and which revolves around a single sort of incident room. You know, like in, in crime dramas, there's an incident room which all the agencies contribute to. And I think that that has also been very important because information flows very much better through the agencies themselves, through the responders themselves. So I think those two things have contributed to this. But, you know, we're by no means out of the woods. Of course. All right. Thank you so much, Laura. It's a pleasure. Laura Spinney is a freelance science journalist based out of Paris. You can find a link to her piece at sciencemag.org slash podcasts. And that concludes this edition of the Science Podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for the show, write to us at sciencepodcast at aaas.org. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast, or you can listen to us on the Science website. That's sciencemag.org slash podcasts. To place an ad on the Science Podcast, contact midroll.com. The show was produced by Sarah Crespi and Megan Cantwell and edited by Podigy. Jeffrey Cook composed the music. On behalf of Science Magazine and its publisher, AAAS, thanks for joining us.